So hello everyone and welcome to another conversation of the third cycle of conversations on corporeal architecture. And today it's again my honor that for the, for the third time, I have as guests uh, welcoming Alberto Perez Gomez. Alberto Perez Gomez studied architecture and practiced in Mexico City. In 1983, he became director of the Carleton University School of Architecture in Ottawa, Canada. Since 1987, occupied the Bronfman Chair at McGill University, where he founded the History and Theory postgraduate programs. His books include Architecture and the Crisis of Modern Science from 1983 with the Hitchcock Award in 1984, Polyphilia 1992, Architectural Representation and the Perspective Hinge from 1997, Built Upon Love, Architectural Longing After Ethics and Aesthetics from 2006, and finally, Attunement and Timely Meditations from 2016. Alberto, thank you so much for joining us again. It's my pleasure, Maria. Thank you for having me. So if I can have the screen, I don't know if... Uh, are you... Yes. Uh, can you see the first slide? No, not yet. I th you have to share it again. Oh, I have to you share have it to again. Share. So I have to stop yes, yes. Okay. Yes, we see it. Perfect. Very good. So thank you for, for having me. I decided today I would uh, I would give a lecture. I've had an easy ride with you. You always just ask me questions, which is very nice. But I thought I would do something that uh, I've been preparing for this course that we will have in Europe with Tatiana in the summer. So <clears throat> since I had a little lecture, I, th I thought I would I would test it with you. <laughs> So I, I want to discuss about, <clears throat> about the fields of architecture, because I think we are, we, are, we are a bit lost. We live in very confusing times. And I think uh, in, in, in many regards, confusing times, you know, with the horrible war in Europe now, and uh, it's hard to talk about, about architecture in these situations, but, but I guess we have to. <laughs> And, um, and, and I think it's, it's confusing even more so for architecture. Um, there is uh, plenty of design and construction going on around the world and, and research of course takes place in many areas, particularly on technical subjects such as resilience and sustainability. But few people really seem to understand what is the core of the discipline or even be concerned with the core of the discipline. Uh, I want to say a few words around this important question, which I think I've always believed all my life that it is a crucial one. And, and one that perhaps surprisingly for you uh, uh, is not a new question. The, the problem of what architecture actually can, can contribute to society has been around for about 200 years. I think it's um, Napoleon who, who first famously stated that in building a modern state, in his case, modern France, he had absolutely no need for architects. He would rather work with engineers that were efficient builders and did not waste any money. This actually signaled a deep change that took place in Western cultural sensibility around that time. Today inherited by technological global civilization. We cannot simply take for granted that we know what architecture is, that it is basically the buildings produced for consumption by a group of so-called service professionals with a license from varied jurisdictions who legitimize their products by signing and stamping a set of drawings with a registered patent. Culturally, architecture has lost its center, a loss that saw its inception with the transformations that brought about European cultures into modernity. These changes manifested in architectural thinking during the late 17th century first, and then crystallized in the early 19th century, around the time of Napoleon. My position is that despite the grave ecological and political problems that characterize today our physical environment, despite the conceit of architectural professionals 
wishing to participate in our global consumer society. Architecture has indeed something specific to contribute to the common good, something totally other than fashionable, formerly novel buildings or sustainable edifices that are nothing more than optimized stopgap solutions to the very problems created by technology. And I am convinced that the only way to attain some clarity about what is central to our discipline and potentially to our practices is to cast a more careful, truly contextualized retrospective view into the history of architecture. While trusting our perceptions about contemporary architectural creations that truly move us, because this is also very important. Those physical environments that seem to embody both seduction and compassion that reveal qualitative places retrieved from the continuum of banal Cartesian space, creating appropriate atmospheres and opening up communicative settings for cultures. Such are creations characterized by an aesthetic quality, as we often affirm, but in a very different sense from the subjective formal composition we associate with Baumgartian 18th century scientific aesthetic judgment. Rather, they convey a thesis in its original Greek sense, a primarily emotional, multi-sensory cognition that enables the very possibility of perceptual meaning or sense to appear. Its effect being a truly relevant beauty, a seductive and even awesome quality, destabilizing through its novelty, yet also recognizable as familiar, and thus capable of bringing about an attunement of human life with cultural and natural orders. And even more, ultimately enabling a recognition of our sense of purposefulness in our natural and cultural world, a spiritual realization, our possibility of participation and belonging in a creative biosphere. This central quality of architecture, understood in Western pre-modern architecture as harmony, is no longer a matter of numerical proportions or geometries like in the past, yet it is resonant with the more recent romantic German concept of Stimmung, referring to a moving and appropriate environment or atmosphere. In fact, in English, milieu, uh, atmosphere is always problematic in English as a translation of, of Stimmung. French is better, you know, like milieu or ambiance would be better translations. One that may arise from a designer's empathic and poetic vision for a future human life. Moreover, it is a quality that cannot be reduced to styles or formal syntax. To grasp this argument fully and thus come closer to architecture's proper field, I believe we must first recognize the historical complexity of our discipline. One that both shifts with cultural changes and in some ways also remains the same. Though addressing deep and often similar existential questions, architecture provides diverse answers appropriate to specific times and places. It is simply wrong to identify our shared tradition of architecture with a chronological collection of buildings, understood as useful creations whose main significance was to provide added pleasure through potentially superfluous ornament. This definition, associating architecture with the Beaux-Arts, the fine arts, dates only from the 18th century and hardly does justice to the broad changing historical definitions of our field in human civilization. It is equally reductive to accept the more recent semiological critique, which again identifies architecture with buildings as univocal political or religious signs, at worst, ominous forms of repressive symbolization. In this short talk, a few brief examples to counter this prevalent bias will have to suffice. 
In ancient Greece, for instance, there was no word for architecture. The term was actually invented by the Latins, by Cicero, you know, at, at that time, the time of Cicero. There was, however, a word to name the architect, architecton, meaning in most cases, the principal craftsman. You probably have heard that story. This is clear in the story of Daedalus. The architecton's responsibilities included the crafting of defensive weapons, such as the shield you see there, wondrous bronze sculptures, ships, textiles, and of course, public buildings. Yet, surprisingly, the architecton as a term was first used to name a dramatic character in the theater. The epithet was applied, for example, to Odysseus in the satire play Cyclops by Euripides, to a character, Odysseus, who was responsible for bringing about a cultural order, an original social foundation, especially in the absence of a divinity that might intervene in the plot. The architect was responsible for clearing a space of communication, making possible a harmonious atmosphere for the prospering of culture. <clears throat> During the European Middle Ages, on the other hand, I mean, jumping, of course, far ahead, these are just snippets that I want to give you, to provoke you, to think outside of the box, if you like, about what the, the discipline is about. During the European Middle Ages, on the other hand, architect with a capital A was a term that was associated specifically with God, the Judeo-Christian creator. He was the architect. And sometimes the term was used for the bishop or the abbot. In other words, for the clients of architecture, the patrons that might dream of a building enterprise and then bring about a, 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 you know, a collection of craftsmen and master craftsmen to actually accomplish or build the dream. The issue was never the creation of aesthetic objects, but rather the place for ecclesia, which is of course, the, you know, it's both the congregation and the name for the church, for rituals that answered fundamental human questions and served as well as authentic public spaces. That's the nature of the medieval cathedral, as you probably know. At the time of the Renaissance, once the creative capacities of individual humans believed back then to be endowed with divine minds were acknowledged, the architect became a figure more familiar to us. You probably know the story from Brunelleschi, Alberti, all these people. Yet, despite the association sometimes put forward between architecture with painting and sculpture, most famously by Giorgio Vasari in the 16th century, architecture always remained distinct in approach and methods of representation and included the design of machines, fortifications, gardens, stage set designs, and ephemeral structures as well as buildings. Once again, appropriate atmospheres, settings, harmonious and commensurate, contributing to psychosomatic health and thus primarily to the common good of society. Architecture may then be understood as a discipline that over the centuries has seemed capable of offering humanity through widely different incarnations and modes of production, far more than superfluous pleasure or a technical solution to pragmatic necessities. Architecture is manifest in those places that speak back to us and resonate with our dreams while enabling our actions and our cultural habits. It incites us to real meditation to personal thought and imagination, opening up the space of desire that allows us to be at home while remaining always incomplete and open to our personal death, unveiling a glimpse of the sense of existence 
and revealing our limits. While this evokes an architecture that responds to cultural values, fundamentally compassionate and not egocentric, our technological world civilization with its modern political values and universal human rights adds a level of complexity. Cultures must thrive emancipated from universal mythologies and religions. And the answers of positivistic rationality point in the direction of planning, democratic consensus, and parametric reductionism, which unfortunately totally miss the mark. We must instead valorize the poetic imagination of the architect, each one of you, each one of us, a controversial position when one seeks the common good in our world of complex interrelated environmental problems. Indeed, architecture does not emerge as a product of social or economic forces, anonymous algorithms or committee design. While granting the collaborative nature of our discipline, a personal imagination with deep cultural roots has been at work in the most moving architecture from the past and present. It is important to elucidate how this is possible. We tend to misunderstand aesthetic value as merely formal and emancipated from ethical value. This is a condition that we have inherited from the late enlightenment, a misconception that has been corrected by philosophers like Hans Georg Gadamer in his meditations on the relevance of beauty that you can read in German, of course, so you are lucky. Our rational civilization tends to oppose emotional understanding to intellectual cognition, while many traditional cultures never accepted such a distinction. As I suggested, also the early Greeks understood aesthesis as a form of multi-sensory emotional cognition, both addressed to feeling and intellect, a form of meaning both intended and perceived in Europe and present in architecture even beyond the moment when it was first questioned by the Frenchman Claude Perrault in his writings his, his writings about architecture of Cartesian inspiration at the end of the 17th century. In a wonderful book titled Descartes' Error, the distinguished Portuguese neurologist Antonio Damasio has demonstrated scientifically how in fact emotions are directly related to clear thinking rather than getting in the way of our cognitive capacities. We can, for example, find a clear manifestation of this unified understanding of architectural value in the writings of Vitruvius, suggesting the very aim and specificity of the discipline. Writing in the first century of the Christian era, Vitruvius includes sundials there on the left of the screen, machines such as the, the water, screw uh, pump on the middle and buildings as the three main products of architecture. <clears throat> the last two machines and buildings capable of meaning through a mimesis of the cosmos, reflecting through their inherent geometric ordering and mathematical proportions, the star dance of the heavens. While sundials on the left made possible the transcription of the orthogonal cardinal orientation from the heavens onto earth. So we, we know where north, south, east, and west is, enabling the proper orientation of cities and buildings. It is important to keep in mind that such order was emotionally charged as well as intellectually recognized as symbolic, precisely because almost nothing else in the world of man exhibited the regularity observed by the naked eye in the motions of the five visible planets, the sun and the moon. 
the Greeks qualified all these artifact, artifacts made by the architect as thaumata, meaning wondrous, because their main, their main purpose was precisely to convey such wonder, both awe and admiration. A form of beauty grounded in eros, the archetype emotion, ultimately sexual desire. Thus, Vitruvius declares that besides solidity and commodity, the main quality of architecture is Venustas, clearly to connote the quality of Venus, Aphrodite for the Greeks, the goddess of love. Thus, architecture must be able to seduce and by inspiring desire, make evident to the inhabitant the significant yet limited and finite nature of the space of human dwelling. At the same time, Vitruvius argued for a temperate architecture, so harmonious and temperate, which actually coincide in, 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 in Stimu, actually, etymologically. He argues for a temperate architecture, the result of the same mimetic operations. Its harmonic quality is a condition of experience, a sort of attunement with the environment made possible through its careful orientation to the sun and the winds, and acknowledging the existing topographic and natural conditions in order to make possible a wholesome life. In other words, its beauty resides in its capacity to produce a healthy environment for both body and mind, a properly human space that is evidently good, responding appropriately to natural conditions and in continuity with cultural habits. Let me emphasize, such architectural beauty is a quality altogether different from formal composition in the sense of modern aesthetics after Alexander Baumgarten's 18th century interpretation, a quality enshrined today in all matter of empty, self-referential and self-serving formalisms, unfortunately common in so-called avant-garde architecture, and thus contributing to confuse the issue under discussion while perpetuating a 19th century misunderstanding. Thus, I think I can now put it to you that what is crucial to architecture is not its capacity to communicate a particular meaning through some formal syntax, but rather the possibility of enabling places that complete us and let us dwell poetically and purposefully on earth. This recognition of wholeness occurs in an experience that addresses bodily consciousness with its emotions, its memories, its imagination and dreams. And like in a poem, its meaning is inseparable from the experience of the poem itself. It cannot be paraphrased. It occurs in presence, in the thick living present, which is never just a point that is first an attunement of our pre-reflective embodied consciousness through actions in the world. And only secondly, an issue of representation. Consequently, architectural meaning cannot reside in an aesthetic object, nor in a spatial geometry. Good architecture choreographs situations. When successful, Architecture allows for participation in meaningful action, conveying to the participant an understanding of his or her place in the world. In other words, it opens a clearing for the individual's experience of purpose through participation in cultural institutions. A further example from Vitruvius provides a fine illustration of such situational meaning. When he describes the way the theater, a paradigmatic ancient institution, both for the Greeks and the Romans, conveys its sense 
to the spectators as they participate in the event of the dramatic representation. The circular plan of the building is mimetic of the cosmos. It's 12 divisions, you can see there in the, in the image on the right. It's, a, it's an image from the 16th century, but it does the trick, you know, it's what Vitruvius is describing in his, his original text. The circular plan is mimetic of the cosmos. It's 12 divisions generating the parts of the building emulate the order of the zodiac. And the proportional harmony of this geometry is crucial. <clears throat> Yet the meaning of the building is not given as a voyeuristic and detached examination of the monument as object. It is not in the details, in the materials, or in our experience as we visit today, you know, as we go as tourists. Rather, it is only conveyed, and I quote Vitruvius here, when the spectators sit with their pores open in a performance. And the whole event becomes cathartic, a purification that allows for the spectators to understand through their participation in the spatio-temporal structure of the drama, including plot, music, and dance, their place in the universe and in the civic world, itself a not merely created space, but recovered out of the topography of sites a priori made significant by cultural stories. Thus, it follows that architecture's disclosure of beauty and meaning is never exclusively spatial, but is always bound to temporality. And yet, it has the capacity of changing one's life in the vivid present a thick presence that, as I said, is not merely a point between past and future, but the true dimensionality of life, exemplified by the way we experience music. It operates like magic and can transform us like an erotic encounter. In this sense, it has important resonances with surrealism's convulsive beauty from the 20th century. For this reason, architectural meaning can never be fully objectified, reduced to functions, ideological programs, formal or stylistic formulas. This is particularly important for modernity, for it seems that whenever buildings become idols or signposts, like the logo of a corporation or a national government, they lose at least in part their capacity for edification. They should rather allow us to see through to meaning precisely by not restricting it, in themselves meaning no single thing. In one of my previous books, I have argued for building an architecture upon love, understood both as erotic seduction through tactile material form and as brotherly compassion and empathy through a careful consideration of program understood not as a list of parts given by some client, but as a literary rendering of a promise of a future life. Imagination is both our capacity for truly free play and our faculty to make stories and to partake through careful listening and humility from the language and vision of those to whom our projects represent a promise for the common good. Since we do not share, like our more distant ancestors, a cosmological ground, a perception of the universe as fundamentally changeless, limited, and straightforward, we must ground the ethical architectural imagination in historical precedent. Yet, as Friedrich Nietzsche clearly suggested in the 19th century, this is anything, anything but equivalent to repetition. We need history precisely not to repeat it. Mm -hmm. The issue is to find ways to interpret history to enable future possibilities for an inclusive society, seeking significant innovation rather than mere novelty. 
Thus, authentic architecture may aspire to interpret traces of habits from past and present practices to create compassionately and negotiate the nearly infinite possibilities for production in view of our now real cultural diversity and the proliferation of instrumental methodologies and computer software capable of producing endless novelty. Contemporary philosophers often point out that infinite progress is impossible. The world and its resources are finite. And this unmasks a fallacy in sustainable development. And yet to project architecture inherently means to propose through the imagination a better future for a society. It is inherently an ethical practice a promise, and this should not be equivalent to a mindless search for consumable novelties disconnected from history. The architect therefore must act responsibly. And for this, the languages we speak play a crucial role, allowing her or him to articulate a position. Where do you stand? The word is crucial for architecture. Expression in analogy to poetic language became central to enlightenment theory and still enabled 18th century architects such as Etienne Riboulet in the slide to design eloquent atmospheres. It is this possibility which is first disregarded in the early 19th century functionalism enabling a form of design that is no more than problem solving. This attitude remains prevalent in architectural production and education ever since, culminating today in our parametric obsessions and has contributed crucially to our confusion. The production of precise working drawings and specifications following building codes, potentially actualized through robotic fabrication does not automatically result in architecture. And the transparency of the process operating through mathematical codes creates a dangerous delusion. While we must grant that words and deeds never fully coincide, this is to be celebrated rather than deplored. This opaqueness of the language we speak in our everyday lives characterizes the very nature of human communication. Never coincidental with the word with a capital W of some Judeo-Christian God for whom to name was to make. Like the making of poetic artifacts, the possession of symbolic multivocal languages is among the most precious gifts that makes us human perhaps more precious than our approximations to an ideal scientific or mathematical universal language. Spoken languages are natural to man, part of the flesh of the world that includes our embodied consciousness and its environment. <clears throat> As George Steiner has eloquently stated, our over three and a half thousand distinct languages for a single species, and and a few centuries ago, there were about five and a half thousand. Eh? We have lost a few. So many languages for one single species, often living near each other and, and these languages being mysteriously diverse, capable of speaking poetically in ways that always enrich our experience of reality, is the ultimate enigma which no evolutionary theory of man can ever reduce. No matter what we produce for others, once the work inhabits the public realm, it is truly beyond our control. An expressed intention can never fully predict the work's meaning. It is the others that decide its destiny and its final significance. Despite this apparent limitation, I would like to argue that true architecture emerges from phenomenological continuity between thinking and making between words in any specific language, English, Spanish, German, and deeds, between words and deeds. 
well-grounded intentions on the part of the creator are crucial to generate architecture and imply a whole style of thinking and action, a culture, a past life and thick network of, con of connections, far more than what an individual is capable of articulating at the surface of consciousness or through one specific project. In other words, architecture is born of phronesis, a Greek word that we can translate as prudence or wisdom in the sense of Aristotle. Phronesis, prudence, is a rhetorical skill. It comes from language based on historical understanding, one that has little to do with formal dexterity and personal style. It is essential for the development of a coherent praxis, which literally means to articulate a political position with regards to a given task. History in this sense provides guidance since it engages alien artifacts to tell us their stories through interpretation. One that acknowledges as positive the potential bias implicit in the questions that we ask and which are crucial for contemporary practice. This is essentially a history for the sake of the future, one meant to enhance our vitality and creativity, rather than one that may immobilize us through useless data, some immoderate respect for all things, or unattainable idealized models. The architecture and words that express the praxis of other times and places must be understood in the light of relevant contemporary questions, yet with full consideration of the cultural context of their makers. <clears throat> I always like to cite the wonderful example of Le Corbusier's Dominican convent of La Tourette. As you know, it's a, a, a kind of very mature work, late corp, right? Um, mm. Which is a building that is deliberately grounded on history, on a traditional monastic footprint. And yet, if you have been there or if you can go there, please go spend the night. It's very cheap. You can spend the night there and it's a fantastic experience for anyone that wants to be an architect. Grants an experience of ecumenical spirituality, completely non-denominational, through endless surrealist reversals. And despite being only remotely connected to traditional Catholic rituals, yet can still be qualified by the users as the most spiritual of all Dominican sites. Thus, the process of historical interpretation, appropriating that which is acknowledged as truly distant yet relevant, makes it possible to render past voices and even formal expressions into contemporary time and politics, rather than assuming a universal language at work or a progressive teleology. This model of understanding is equally crucial to produce true architecture in transcultural modes within our global village. You know, because we, you know, you know how the reality is now becoming that we have all these cultures living together in one city, right? It's happening mm -hmm. constantly through a humble and caring dialogue rather than an imposition of clever ideas. True architecture addresses questions that truly matter for our humanity in culturally specific terms, revealing an enigma behind everyday events and objects. Ultimately, the open question of how we belong in the biosphere and how we are consciousness, irreducible to elemental physical particles in motion. Our built environment is pregnant with ambivalent meanings, exacerbated by the mock impartiality of technology and of a detached self-referential <laughs> aesthetics of novelty. This is in turn made worse by a culture of distraction that seems content to live behind the screens of electronic devices. This is truly a vicious circle, is the paradigm of a vicious circle. Yet the stakes for our humanity are enormous. While true architecture is difficult, it is important to grasp that without such architecture, 
we will keep losing our way as a global civilization. Planners and politicians building a neutral or featureless world contribute to our sense of despair and nihilism, while so-called star architects also contribute to our disorientation by producing decontextualized buildings that may look like circulation flows, blobs, shoeboxes, or spiky stars, irrespective of where they happen to be. Our perception is not passive, it is action. And our consciousness doesn't end at the edge of our skulls. Neurologists now affirm, corroborating earlier insights from continental phenomenology, that our mental life involves the body and the environment beyond the surface membranes of our organism. We are deeply, deeply affected by our environments. As Rainer Maria Rilke once said beautifully, the inner is the outer. Our psychosomatic well being is at stake. And this environment is the space of human communication, of primary orality, gesture, and habits, the space where we find ourselves through others. Thus, we may conclude that the foregrounding of such space of communication, which is not reducible to telecommunications, is of the essence in authentic architecture. And one very last observation, given all of the above and the reticence of our global privatized and commodified civilization to accept the significance of such public space, I have spoken elsewhere of the importance of recognizing the architecture implicit in theoretical projects after the time of Piranesi in the European 18th century. This could include, like in the past, much more than buildings, such as ephemeral structures transforming the meanings of cities, installations and artistic works conveying atmospheres, and even the evocations of cinematographic or literary spaces which have become important in the wake of our modernity, once building architecture became problematized by the very presumptions of technological production. This adds an additional level of confusion and complexity to our question, since such manifestations are, in my view, legitimate issues for research framed through the appropriate questions. Such works are able to create poetic architectural images it is true, for example, that John Haydock's architecture is effectively embodied in his projects and books deployed between drawings and fictions. Yet, let me finally emphasize the possibility of architecture as physical environment manifested as cities and buildings in the terms I have evoked, speaking to pre-reflective consciousness in habitual action is essential for the prevalence of the human species with our full gifts, capable of participating in the very creativity of nature and perhaps, perhaps truly evolving morally towards a hoped global brotherhood. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto, for this really wonderful and uh, inspiring lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. <clears throat> um, I, I will make a few questions, but then I really want to give a lot of space to our students because I saw that they were very focused and they were also taking notes and really paying a lot of attention. And I really want as much as possible to make this space for them to, to participate as much as possible in this conversation. Uh, we can almost feel you live here <laughs> because we are finally present present in this room. Uh, maybe if we would have a hologram, it would it would be <laughs> a bit closer, <laughs> but it would never be the same. It would never be the same. Uh, Alberto, I would like to to start with the with the commentary. It's not so much of a question, but more a commentary. How wonderful it was that you started your lecture by showing all these possibilities that the word architect uh, has, uh, taking in consideration the different meanings that the, the word architect had through history 
and also in these different uh, cultural contexts, because we maybe nowadays we are so distracted with all the noise of, of the practice and maybe of the technology and all, all the speed that we are always pressured into following that we forget that the architect was someone who was not only doing buildings and interiors, was also someone who was orchestrating performances, uh, theater plays, um, creating creating this space for for connection for connection between uh, between people in the city, uh, and also machines and fortification. So all these aspects aspects of of design that touch us uh, uh, in very intimate ways and, and at all, all scales. And I think that at the moment, especially you also mentioned in your, in your presentation, it's, it's not something that happened only now with the digitalization. It's a, it's a longer, longer process, but it really has to do with this really close relationship to technology and also maybe this philosophical thinking that pushes us towards an extreme rationality, suppressing all the other part, part of the emotions. So I would like to ask you, Alberto, in your own path as an architect and also a historian and teacher, when was the moment that you realized that we were leaving the emotions behind? Did you have an experience that worked as a kind of uh, epiphany for you that, that led you to develop this interest further? Yes, I quite early. You know, I had I my own uh, my own I, my own uh, architectural education was very technical. In the context, actually, of the National Polytechnic Institute of Mexico in Mexico City, which was a school that was uh, actually greatly inspired by Hannes Meyer. He visited there, and he was very crucial there. And uh, so there was, of course, this left-wing uh, dimension to it, which was very nice. But it was also incredibly uh, technical. It's really about efficiency, and so uh, I guess I was very young when I, you know, like I remember. I, I do remember one, you know, because you start and you do a house or you you don't really think about these things. Or, but then there was a project, I think in third or fourth year, uh, that we we were asked to go to a small town, uh, north northwest of Mexico City, I think it was. It's a place called Lerma. Uh, Mexico City is very high up in the mountains. It's like 2,200 meters over sea level. This place was even higher. It's, uh, it's even higher up. And it's, it was a, it's, back then, it was a small town. Now everything is, is huge, of course. But uh, we were asked to design, the project was actually to design social housing for, uh, for, for the community. And so I visited, and, and well, the community was basically a peasant community, you know, where where people. Uh, uh, I remember I was kind of, you know, I am an urban boy. I'm an urban person. I never, I grew in Mexico City, very protected. I never knew anything, but I went there and I visited with some of these uh, people, and uh, they basically take their animals inside for heat, you know, during the because it's very cold in the mountain. They take their cows and their whatever they have sheep sheep not so much sheep but uh, but but cows mostly uh, into the house and, uh, and and this stupid professor of ours wanted us to design uh, like uh, high, high for, like high buildings you know like three stories or five stories or I mean you make it with you you needed an elevator after a certain point and and I remember right I remember I remember I was very shocked I said. What are, what are you doing? I'm not sure it has to do with feeling, but it's really it's just a complete dis disconnect between the between the aims of this modern understanding of architecture and uh, and and the reality of a cultural situation that was not even acknowledged in my schools. You know, I I, I was I got a um, I was basically scolded for bringing these things up. We have to bring these people up to modern standards. You know, who cares if they bring in their cow? They can leave it out. Uh, or they will will deal with that in some way. Uh, mm -hmm. I I that was my first. But I was very young. But uh, of course, it, slowly one understands better. I mean, this question of how uh, feeling and thinking are are connected, of course, became clear when I studied phenomenology and and then the the works of Damasio has been very have been very important. You know, because he really. 
he really deals with it in a very scientific way and it's brilliant. Uh, and so, uh, but that came later. I, I think it's a slow process. For me, it was more about cultural values in the beginning, how, how modern architecture was completely blind, uh, had a kind of formulaic, uh, dogmatic uh, view of things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not exactly what I'm talking about now. It's a little different today, you know? I think it's, today, I think it, it's not that black and white. There's more sophistication, but, but still, uh, uh, I mean, many of the problems that I perceived back then, I think, were at the, at the root of my own questioning. That's why I didn't practice right away. I left uh, Mexico and then went to study more and eventually became a professor, not because I wanted to, but because that's the way life develops. I thought I would go back to practice, you know, just educate myself a bit more. But, uh, but I got the opportunity to teach with Dalibor Vesely at, uh, at the AA in London when I was doing my PhD. And after that, I didn't look back, you know, I was like, I, but uh, I guess, I don't know. I, I never planned my life the way it turned out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which is also something that maybe, maybe we are also not so encouraged to do anymore. Now, now when you're 15, you already have to have a very clear vision of what you want to what you want to achieve and what you're going to go and all the plans and all, all, of, all of these things. But uh, for me, it's very relatable to, to hear about this uh, experience because that's also, it was also through my own uh, studies in architecture school that I also, um, and we talked about it, I think in our other conversations with our other groups of, my other groups of students, um, I also experienced this um, this uh, this in in my studies. It was not maybe not so much technical, but definitely the artistic, uh, more more creative uh, part was definitely not not really encouraged. And we were not very encouraged to explore also different solutions. We were encouraged to commit to understand the program to create the program and then make sure that all the regulations were, were followed and so, but, but it was also somehow expected that we would be able to manage all of these things and create something exciting. This was also something that, that we were very uh, encouraged to do. And exactly what this excitement was about was also something that intrigued me because I always felt that somehow we never had the time or the space to go very deep into things. So that's also why after practice and in practice, my first experience was with practice was absolutely disappointing because we train training people were working these super long hours at the office, including weekend. And uh, in the context we were, we weren't even paid, which was also not very <laughs> motivating. So we did all that work to do these competitions. And, you know, in one week we would have to come up with these exciting proposals and most of them weren't leading anywhere. And then we had a few projects that were going more recurrently where we would endlessly revise, revise, revise. And I was lucky because from the group of my office colleagues, I was the only one who ever now and then went to the building site, but it was a punishment because they wanted to get rid of me every now and then. <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. I think that's that's where I learned the best and it was that was the best part for me of my training. But I also wanted to learn more. I had this feeling of this connection between, uh, between what we were designing and the needs of people, the needs of the people we were designing for. And actually, uh, yeah. we, yes, go ahead, go ahead. What I, what I was saying is that I think that for me, the what was problematic, well, what, what I've learned, and that's one, that's one of the things that I talked about and, and that really hasn't changed, is that, that architecture tends to be formulated as a kind of problem solving operation. It's like, we have a problem, we have to solve it. Whereas I think that in the end, uh, the, you know, the, the issue of making present the enigma of being human is more like revealing a question rather than solving a problem. And, 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 and uh, it's something that, uh, that certainly in, in my school, this would have never been you know, accepted. You have to solve a problem. You know, it's a planning problem. Uh, it's uh, like solving an equation. This is really something that comes from the early functionalism and through Semper, you know, Semper wrote uh, very nice things, but he also was 
get completely obsessive about this functionalist uh, thinking. He thought that you could uh, formulate a, a design problem like you write an equation, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the, the solution is like function of X, Y, Z, etc. And as long as you, if you can bring into, into play all the variables that are, that are part of, including culture, you can find the perfect solution. It's like mm -hmm. solving an equation. And this is the wrong way to understand architecture. That's the problem. Uh, and uh, that's... Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's probably more, uh, it should be more complex than that. And this makes me think about something that I also have been bringing into our uh, last conversations because we have this assignment, the students are working to, to make a performative interpretation of the machine stops from Ian Forster. Uh, and it's very funny because there's one segment there that uh, the protagonist of the story says that he managed to find a way to escape the machine. He found by himself a way out and he trained his body by moving, by going outside. And first his body was very weak. He was not used to the outside anymore uh, because uh, you could only be on the outside with a re respirator. And if you wouldn't have the respirator, you could be, you could die, something could happen. So it's very, in some way, similar to what we have been experiencing. And we also see through the development of the protagonism, how he talks about his experience of being in the world by how his body felt. Uh, and he says the body as the measure, the body is the measure. So bringing again this feeling of, of the experience, the direct experience as a measure for, for also for the sense of place. And he also mentions in the text, because of the machining, we have lost our sense of space because we don't move around so much anymore. And I think that this is something that now with all the measurements and the technology and all this this potential we have of analyzing everything th through data we are so obsessed with getting values for everything that we forget we've, we are just using maybe our or privileging the rational logic too much and we forget about the other part how could we maybe how could you envision we could maybe also bring into the classroom and bring into the practice uh, ways that we could somehow balance this because we, we won't be able also to go back to a less analytical mode. So how, how would you propose maybe would be a way to find a balance to this tendency? I think, I think self, like a true self-awareness of the problem is very important. I, I, there might be some other ways, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't know how to answer that. Uh, in terms of uh, of specific uh, tasks within a, a design culture or design environment, but uh, but I think a, a self awareness of the limitations of measurement uh, in relation to experience is crucial. And that's something that actually uh, is very nicely done by by phenomenology. You know, examples such as how uh, that in phenomenology, for example, there, there is a, there is a, it's a very interesting question of vertical measure, how vertical measure uh, is actually qualitatively different from horizontal measure. Uh, and that you can always experience that. Uh, and, and it's almost uh, like if you think about it uh, in certain ways, it can seem like a paradox, like somehow, if you measure something vertically uh, and then you project the distance horizontally, it's as if somehow the, the measurement stretches. It doesn't remain constant. So that a centimeter vertically is not a centimeter horizontally in your experience. And this is something that a number of uh, psychologists and not only you know philosophers, but psychologists like, uh, Vandenberg wrote a book called Formatabletic Reflections, it talks about this, how if you, if you look at a tower and you imagine, even if you have a practiced eye, you know, you're an architect and you try to imagine how far it will go if it falls, you always underestimate because the horizontal distance is not the same qualitatively as the vertical distance. These kinds of exercises, it's possible to make them into exercises, you know, to become much more aware of the fact that that, uh, that, that we um, miss something of reality if we, if we constantly 
give priority to measurement over quality. So that the experience of time, that's another one, right? The, 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 if you had fun with my lecture, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. It may have felt like an eternity or it may have felt very short. This qualitative feeling of time is primary as opposed to secondary. There is, there is a reality to this feeling of time that often is expressed in dreams, actually very clearly, but that is a very real part of everyday life. Just as the elasticity of measurement, uh, this changing condition is a very much part of everyday life. It's not that we cannot measure things. Of course, we can measure the distance from where you are to your house, uh, you know, with an odometer in the car. But, but if you are hungry or if you are anguished or if you are happy, the, the, the distance will change. Mm -hmm. And so this, the, the, just the awareness of that uh, starts to, I think, have an impact on how we design, how we think about things. Um, but I'm not sure if that's exactly what you were asking, but that's something that comes to mind because it's clear yes. that, that this is, a, is an issue in, in phenomenology. It's, it's not that you cannot, you know, it's not that you shouldn't measure or that you cannot measure. It's what is primary in experience and what is primary in experience mm -hmm. is not measurement. Yes, and uh, this this is what I was uh, going for. Yes, and thank you for this answer because it made me think also uh, in connection to another another topic that that we have been talking, which has to do with the we we are more and more pushed into having short attention spans because we are used now to processing more and more bits of information which come in a shorter and more compressed form, and so we are already so used to this rhythm. <laughs> That it becomes more and more difficult to to take the time to pay attention to something which develops slower to be able to go deeper, and this is also something that I that I already realized some time ago, and so I've tried to encourage also in my classes, also with my students, that we do these exercises with the body that kind of give the feeling, or I hope that they give the feeling to extend time a little bit, uh, so that even maybe in a short amount of time with less movement or more concentration that, that we have a feeling that maybe the time expands, but also being able to stay for longer amount, uh, periods of time um, contemplating something or, or staying with something, which becomes more and more um, difficult. And um, I may try to make this in connection with, um, for example, when, when we look at the wonderful example we showed of, of Le Corbusier's uh, uh, La Tourette and uh, how much how, the amount of time he took to develop this project and, and not just the time of the project, but also the time of his lifespan and career, which was all behind influencing how this project would develop. Uh, and, and so all the knowledge that became visible and manifests in this building. This also has to do with this subjective feeling of time. So not just the time that the building was built, but the whole time that led to this, um, to the, to this proposal. Yes. No, I, 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 I agree. I think we should learn that. People talk a lot about that, right? Going back to a, to a, a slower pace. But I agree completely. You have to... Uh, it's 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 uh, probably uh, difficult for younger people. I have, you know, we I'm a different generation, so I, I take my time. <laughs> but uh, but yes, it's 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 tricky. Even uh, even my presentation, I try to make it condensed, and because I know that if I speak, I used to speak for two hours, two and a half hours. We used to have uh, seminars that would go on for five hours, you know. With, and often I even forgot, I would forget that we had to, to have a break for the bathroom. It was crazy in the beginning when I was starting to teach. We just talk and talk and talk and talk and read. And now I can, of course, you know, at some point someone said, Professor, can, we, can you think about a, a break? And then, of course, uh, everything changed. Yeah. Uh, it, we, yes, but I. I, I think that also happens when, when we really love what we're doing. We tend to get distracted and, and that can also be a good sign, but we also need to be nudged into, um, into these other, these other uh, realities that we have to take care of. 
Um, I would like to ask now uh, our students to maybe to, to bring, yes, please go ahead. Uh, we have here, we have to, to take our time here with it, with the also <laughs> with the locomotion until the place where we get the questions because we have a machine here called the owl that will uh, that will allow us to have this to, to have this interaction. I think you need to get a little closer to the owl. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I will probably have some difficulty because I don't see your facial expression, but <laughs> do you think it would be possible? Um, yeah, probably. Just okay. for a few Just for a second, yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, advance a um, consideration, especially regarding your experience when you said it when you were a student um, about the idea of assignments that were so disconnected with the context. Because uh, recently uh, with my lessons and with my laboratories, I've discovered uh, the existence of urban planning, and I'm I became very interested in that. But also, I've discovered how urban planning and single design um, of designing of single buildings are growing so apart. And at least as in my laboratories, I've uh, I've seen I've noticed that, and I cannot understand how is this possible and how like the knowledge and the analysis of the context it's so underestimated like i'm feeling like the the borders of uh, the area that i have to um, design is getting narrower and narrower instead of watching the surroundings and watching how like for instance a single um, even a single a bicycle lane cannot be even connected with the street near in the in the nearby and I cannot understand how is this possible, how those two things are so different now, instead of being part of the same, uh, of the same element, of the, of the same architecture or project. No, it's, it's, it's a very good observation. Unfortunately, you are right. I think the tendency towards specialization, not only from the point of view of urban planning, uh, but also things like landscape architecture uh, that, that you know, become autonomous uh, it's it's a real problem for for real for for an architecture that wants to really consider the qualities of place and integration with the with the with the environment. There are um, there are practices, uh, not many, but there are practices that are trying to work in the opposite direction. You know, uh, I let me tell you, I don't know if you know, uh, you could check. Uh, there are two American practices. One is. Uh, the, um, David Marion Weiss, uh, weissmanfreddy.com. And the other one is James Corner, Field Operations. So, uh, uh, you know, the Marion Weiss and, and James Corner, if you want to check them out, check their websites. These are practices that are, that are, uh, that are um, uh, deliberately trying to, uh, to bring these things together. But I agree that it's really pathetic that uh, that in the in the contemporary world it's not only architecture you know it's everything it's this idea of specialization that you can only know one small thing about something mm -hmm. and then you become completely myopic and then there is impossible to make any sense of of things so if you if you can do anything to work uh, in resisting this condition mm -hmm. i would applaud it but i know that it's it's very hard institutionally to, to do that because people make their money you know becoming specialists of this or that uh, it's been the story of the of the discipline for the last two two, two centuries as well, um, and uh, it's the worst that we can do uh, to to think that way. Like you're you're right. I mean, this is making a virtue out of this uh, ignorance of context is the horrible a horrible way of of working in architecture. Uh, so, uh, thank, thank you very much for the. I don't, have a, I don't have an answer. I just know that there are some. Some architects, I think there are also some in Spain. Uh, I, I remember some practices, maybe you, Maria, maybe you know some people that really try deliberately to make uh, integration between, uh, between urban uh, issues and, and architecture. Thank you for this because I didn't know about it. So thank you very much. 
I will also see if I <laughs> find something or if I remember. Um, but this this was all actually the reason why I made my very first question today to you uh, uh, or, or comment that it's so important to still preserve this idea of the architect not as someone who is completely specialized in working in these one particular kind of projects and so on, or, but to keep a, a broad perspective of all the potentials we we can have to to act and to and to create and to design. Thank you. This was really interesting input. Uh, any other uh, questions? Yes, please go ahead. Um, hi. <laughs> um, I have, um, I don't know, a short question, maybe. Um, so what's your favorite and your least favorite space from I keep made from humans? Just like that, point blank. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My most favorite. No, I don't know. I have many favorite spaces. <laughs> I don't or know. Or what that. do you think where where um, architects or urban planners did a good job in the latest years, not like Corbusier, but a more yeah, recent. Well, yes, I gave you some examples in the lecture, you know, just snippets. Like, uh, I like very much uh, that work by Le Corbusier. Yes, I think that's very important. Uh, of course, it's very particular because it's it was uh, designed as a convent, but it no longer is a convent. It's now a little hostel and you can have your conferences there. So it's, it's uh, and it works very well for that. Um, but uh, but it's always a very different question because I, I never think in general is like that. I think there's there there are there are buildings that are amazing uh, almost in any category in any way. You know there are places that are wonderful. Uh, the the so I I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm also looking just for for us young people what to visit, how to. Um, to see what ah. actually great architecture or great yeah. spaces are, because we collect these pictures are collected in the internet, but not so much in the real time. And now we can you're travel right. again. And you're absolutely right. Uh, well, go go visit some of Sumter's churches uh, in 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 mm. Germany, or uh, or if you can afford it, go to the Bals uh, Spa. You know, it's uh, it's quite something. Uh, go visit uh, some of Gaudi's work. It's fascinating. You have to see it in the flesh rather than. Yeah, uh, I, I did when Barcelona. I was in Barcelona. Yeah. Yes. yeah, go to see some of Caesar's work. Uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 I don't like everything, but I like some work very, very, very much. Uh, uh, there is plenty of stuff that is really quite remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. So there's hope. <laughs> oh, there is hope. Of course, there is hope, but it's hard to. It's, it's, the, the challenge is that this has to become more of a connect. You know, the, your your colleague, I think, has actually the right intuition that this has to happen more in relation to urban to to urban life, to uh, mm -hmm. places that we really share, and uh, rather than being special, like you know, you have this amazing chapel uh, in the middle of the country, like it's it's great, like uh, yeah, I've been there because I studied there. I think I know which one with these um, glass bulbs. Uh huh. Or from Sumtor, I don't yeah. know, Peter Klaus Kapelle. Yes, that's right, that one, yeah. Yeah, that one, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not like an alien. I, I, I like the things that I'm sure you like. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to discuss the issue through a philosophical language to ground it in a True. way more, yeah. uh, is more useful to you because it's complicated because sometimes we see these things through a distorted lens of uh, of 18th century aesthetics and it's more yeah. than that you know those those good works uh, really um, really uh, um, operate in this aesthetic dimension that i describe in the greek sense rather than as a kind of a removed aesthetic judgment or a question of composition uh, so uh, this is the, the challenge because certain things that you get in the internet could look 
could seem similar or like, you know similar mentality or but it's in fact very different because it's basically made a, a you know with novelty in mind or 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 design as pictures rather than as uh, experience yeah or it doesn't fit in the environment at all that's so, right yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah maybe just just a little hint because there's a newsletter and i think it appeared as a as a kind of counterpoint to the zine mm -hmm. and it's called divisare and it's by a group of architects in italy and they make a wonderful selection of, of buildings okay. it's an evolving catalog atlas of of uh, buildings and uh, interiors and public spaces and there's a very very good selection of architecture there nice yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you thank you, thank you very much nice question <laughs> Uh, I don't know, maybe, okay, we we are running a little bit out of time because our students are very um, worried about keeping the time, but maybe we will take just one more question before we finish, if any of you would like to, to take the take this chance. Yeah. Yes, please, come, come. Is there any other who would like to make questions so that we uh, can already organize? <clears throat> one more okay so we will have two more two more questions and if you need to leave you you can leave and you can always catch up on youtube hello first of all thank you for your lecture uh, i found it very very interesting and you showed um, a picture of uh, this ancient theater and um you you told us um that um through um, the participation of people who are sitting there and watching um, what's happening, they understood the place and the Stimmung and was, what was happening there. And um, I was wondering nowadays, if people come to a place, a room or a theater, um, sometimes they only look at the place only through a camera. And um, I don't know if they're in a place um, maybe people have their headphones in. So I thought it was it, today, nowadays, it is different and maybe more difficult to understand um, the way we, we, we feel in the place. And you also mentioned that our job is not to repeat, but to interpret history. And my question is, um, how can we bring it all together? Is it possible to... Um, to, to feel the same thing that people felt back then, um, to experience a room like this. So do we have to get rid of all this media and just um, feel it? Or do we have to somehow um, accept that in architecture and say, okay, how can we bring it together? Or is it even possible to bring it together? So I, yeah, I thought it would be it. Today, nowadays it is um, very different the way we experience. Yes, no, you, you are right. I, and, and, I, and I did mention that at the end, right? That, that we have this tendency to yeah, hide yeah. behind our screens. <laughs> so it makes it very difficult for, for, for architects. I, I completely agree. But at the same time, uh, we all experience, for example, this uh, dilemma with the two years of COVID, what it means not to have real personal interaction. So, you know, we have these two sides. You, you are right. In a certain way, we are a bit blinded by the fact that we can isolate ourselves from the spaces and so it's hard for the architecture to have any like this kind of effect that i was describing in the greek theater where everyone was basically invested in the performance like it was more of a you know it's almost like a religious experience right mm -hmm. like if you believe in something you go to church you are invested in what is happening there and therefore you feel transformed these kinds of experiences are still possible for modern humans they happen paradoxically in the weirdest places. For example, in, in sporting events, like if you are a, a fan of soccer or, or football, right? You go you, and you are part of the team or you, you are a, you're rooting for a team. You become in this kind of moment where a collective is together, you are elevated, you participate. Very much like the Greeks would have felt they understood their place in the world in the theater. So it's possible for us to feel that way uh, because we are the same, we're the same organically. We have, you know, our bodies are human bodies. Uh, but I grant you that it's very difficult uh, today to deal with this culture of distraction 
and 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 removal. So you need an additional like someone you know like to hit be hit on the on the head <laughs> out of your out of your complacency. This is why I also mentioned a little bit surrealism, right? Because surrealism mm -hmm. uh, tries that. It tries to knock you out of your complacency. It's something that Benjamin also spoke about about the nature of the of the modern work of art it has to give you a it has to wake you up so it's not easy i i really understand uh, but uh, but as i also said i think the stakes are very high because if we let it go if we if we become like uh, if we if we really manage to develop a kind of civilization where we can live our lives behind the a screen and nothing else uh, it's conceivably possible but we would have we would have changed the human condition there is something that is lost if you, if you are interested in in a, a very wonderful a very wonderful work of fiction that i always recommend when this question comes up uh, is uh, michel welbeck this is a frenchman a french writer welbeck he's very well known in france i don't know i don't know if he's well known in, in Germany, but I think he's probably translated into German. Uh, the work in French is La Possibilité du Nil, or in English, The Possibility of an Island. If you look for that, it's the only thing he's written that is a little bit like science fiction, but he does it very well because he's a wonderful writer. He imagines this moment, which is like almost where we are, where we can leave the, our whole lives behind the computer screen. Mm -hmm. and everything happens behind the computer screen. I'm not going to tell you what happens, but it fails. It fails for a fantastic reason. He's very good and only a good writer. Like, I completely agree with him in the way that he sees this, this problem. But, but you have to read the fiction to be able to understand it, I think. He does a very good job because he, you, you know, as any good fiction writer, you really get in the, you, you become part of the work and you understand the experience. And it's really very much what you are describing. You know, this idea that you don't look around, you're just in your computer, you're just in your screen, in your cell phone, with your earphones. Uh, so uh, something is missing and, and, and something happens. And, uh, and it has a lot to do with architecture. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, so we don't know, right? Because this is the problem with humanity. We, we, are, we do evolve and we adapt and we change. We know that in, in, in long-term evolution. And it's, it's conceivable that I am like a dinosaur and I'm talking about things that have no longer any importance. I mean, I understand I, that. I don't, I don't but at the same time, I know what we would, I know what we, I know what we would lose if, if this happens. Uh, for, 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 you know, in, in, in any case, it would be, it, it's much, it would be, it's, it's, it would become even easier to, Depersonify the other so that we can commit terrible atrocities, which is part of the problem with this, right? Because the other is no longer another; it's just a picture in the in the screen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyhow, that's it's, but it's a tough problem. I, I thank you for your question. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Well, and I will, I will definitely look for this book and, and read about it. And maybe the next next task of the next course will be to work with it. So I'm, I'm already thinking, mm, this sounds like a really, really good idea. So there was one more question. So I was um, hearing that you studied in Mexico and I've been to Mexico City and it's quite terribly messy. So I have like this question in this spaces that I already feel like full, how do you make space for um, new perspectives? Like these spaces have this behavior that only follows function because Mexico City is like, it has a lot of people, uh, the spaces um, always follow function. They always have this intention to either living or it's a building for working or like they always have a function, but 
they don't give this, they don't allow this feedback like uh, connection to the users, but they are already like full. So what's the strategy to change this behavior and stop following all this function and make spaces for um, connection between me and structure and that they become more livable and I feel like they own, then they're not only following in function, but they want to interact with me in the sense of being in the city, not in an aggressive way. You, you have something in mind in Mexico City? Like what, uh, you're talking about the city in, in general or? No, no, like in the places where it's like uh, full, because there are pretty places like Polanco, which is, more nature, but there are places where are like barely um, public areas or green spaces. They're only built like tall buildings and more street than actually public space. Hmm. So you you are asking me how it might be possible to uh, well. To, to, to do something about uh, what what would you like to see as opposed to uh, not uh, like the sense of being in a street that doesn't have a, a connection with me it's just building yeah, yeah of course of course but yes. it's already feel like we don't have space anymore because they're already filled with buildings so what yeah. would be the strategy to change that and make them like Less, less aggressive to the people that go in them, the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the spaces. Well, I, would mm -hmm. have to, I, 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 I'm not. I mean, I, I grew up there. Uh, <laughs> when I grew up there, the city was uh, really extraordinary. I mean, I'll tell you that story because I don't know how to answer your question. I think that it is probably possible given the, the depth of uh, Mexican culture, that through even some uh, uh, small ephemeral interventions in some key public places, you could at least make some parts of the city a little bit more uh, convivial, a little bit more empathetic to the other. Uh, but of course, it's very hard to, sp to speak about this because the Mexico City, as you know, is a monster. It's a 20 million up plus horror that basically works as a, as a, as a, as a well, but basically it doesn't work as a circulation machine, right? I mean, it's really conceived basically, it was, it has been manipulated uh, with a view of, with a, uh, through, through the models of traffic engineering. And now it's, it's, it's horrible because it's all, it's all it is. When I was growing up, the, the, there was still remnants of the 19th century city, which were which was very much a European model, where you would really, you know, like you would go downtown for fun, you could go and have uh, life in the street. Uh, all that uh, disappeared because because the city grew so much, uh, and and planners were so myopic that all that counted was the paradigm of circulation. This is really the, the curse of 20, well, basically modern planning, you know, starting really with the, with the 19th century. But the fact that all that seems to matter in, 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 uh, in, in, in planning is, is circulation. It's this con the concept of circulation, which is really a modern invention. Nobody thought about architecture having, or, or cities having to do with circulation until the late 18th century. It's actually a, a French man, Pierre Pat, that first imagined the city as, as a network of circulation for water, for air, for waste, you know? And the moment you take that paradigm, you really tend to destroy urban life. It's not only Mexico City, it's all modern cities that are really the paradigm of circulation. So the, the, what in my experience, it became much worse, uh, like after 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, when one major after another, after another, basically tried to accommodate more and more and more cars and, and, and circulation. And now that's all there is, you just circulate. There is no real life anywhere. Uh, 
but as I said, like, the depth of culture is such that maybe that, you know, good, small, uh, local punctual interventions, I'm sure, bring out life here or there. Uh, but, uh, but for me, I, may, I really gave up on Mexico City already in the 1970s. <laughs> <laughs> long, long ago. <laughs> I know some people like it, but I could not possibly live there. I find it really difficult. It's, fa it's fascinating, but it's an unlivable place. It's not human. It's really <laughs> like, for me, you have to become part of the machine. Okay. Thank That's, you. It's really interesting, the circulation. I, I, don't, I don't mean to be nostalgic, but I really <laughs> like Mexico City of my youth very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so we could continue always for a long time, but I would I think I would always find uh, ways to, to keep this conversation going, uh, but we need to stop. We are already half an hour over time from the official time. Thank you so much, Alberto, for this contribution. As always, uh, very grateful. Thank you. And uh, all best wishes for your recovery also. Hi, guys. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.